Uh, thanks very much, Peter and Jeremy. Uh, I've never used Beamer before. I've no idea how to time myself with these slides, but we'll see. It, this is uh, part of a joint project with um, Yilin and Yanis, Loi Zides and uh, Yan Li Sung. And um, this part of the project is about generalizing some, extending some basic results of symplectic geometry to a slightly wider setting of Lie algebroids. And the first thing you learn in symplectic geometry is the, well, the Moser theorem. Locally, uh, you can linearize the symplectic structure. And this is, this is the Weinstein version of that, where you uh, uh, compare uh, symplectic forms along a submanifold. So suppose uh, you have a submanifold, N of a manifold M, and two symplectic forms that agree at all points of the submanifold, then you know you can find a diffeomorphism locally near that submanifold, which fixes the submanifold and which maps uh, one of those sub one symplectic form to the other symplectic form. And uh, so that's a, a well known uh, uh, important result, basic result. And this is an extension of that to a setting of Lie algebroids, uh, where these two forms are A symplectic forms for some Lie algebroid A. And you need to put in some extra conditions, namely that this submanifold should cleanly intersect the Lie algebroid, and that the submanifold should admit an Euler like section, or that the, rather the algebroid should admit an Euler like section along this submanifold. Uh, th so these terms in red, uh, I haven't explained them. I will come back to them later. But I hope you can see this is just an extension of a, the Darbu Moser Weinstein theorem uh, to Lie algebroids. Um, so um, not a very original statement at all. It goes back to Weinstein in particular. And more recently, uh, an example of symplectic Lie algebroids are B symplectic manifolds. And uh, special cases of this result uh, are certainly covered in this paper by Gilliman, Miranda, and Pires on B symplectic geometry, and also in a, a recent Utrecht thesis by uh, Klasse. Um, symplectic Lie algebraids are also a special case of Poisson manifolds, and in a parallel development was a. a explained by Rui Fernandez recently in the uh, Global Poisson uh, seminar. Uh, they found some uh, local models around Poisson submanifolds. Uh, this result is parallel from, but different from our theorem. Our manifolds are Poisson submanifolds, but they're not locally split in the sense of Fernandez and Marco. So it's a parallel, but different somewhat different development. But that's uh, Boom Moser Weinstein. Another famous result is the Marsden Weinstein reduction theorem for Hamiltonian action, Hamiltonian actions of Lie groups. So give yourself some Lie group. And now we have one of these algebroids with an action of the Lie group and a symplectic form. Uh, you rho stands for the action, the mu stands for a moment map. You can do, you can take an inverse image of a coadjoint orbit uh, under the moment map and divide that out by the action. And then the theorem is that that, in, in regular cases, will inherit a nice symplectic al uh, algebroid with a symplectic form. And the symplectic form falls back to the form upstairs, corrected by some term involving the, uh, the, the Kirillov Kostan Suryo symplectic form on the coadjoint orbit. So that's Marston Weinstein reduction, almost verbatim the same as in the ordinary symplectic case. And also well known, if you put these two together, uh, Darbu Moser Weinstein and Marston Weinstein reduction, you get a, uh, so, sorry, I, I am this reduction theorem, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, a symplectic algebroid is also a special case of a Dirac structure, and Burstyn and Krynik have shown how to reduce Dirac structures. 
And our theorem is certainly a special case for that, except that there's some additional information. The Dirac structure in this case extends not or descends not to some random Dirac structure on the quotient, but to a, uh, uh, a symplectic Lie algebraid. And in a log symplectic setting, uh, there's a paper by Gualtieri and co authors where they show uh, also a version of this, this uh, uh, reduction theorem. Okay. Putting together symplectic reduction and Darboumoser Weinstein, you get a Gilliman Sternberg local normal form. And the basic thing about the zero fiber of a moment map is that it's a co isotropic submanifold. So uh, you get a local normal form near that zero fiber. Uh, this is the basis of uh, one of the two best proofs of the dystomat Heckman theorem. One famous proof of the dystomat Heckman theorem is the Althea Bot proof that uses equivariant cohomology. Another uh, famous proof is the Gilliman Sternberg proof, which tells you, uh, which compares the zero fiber of momentum to nearby fibers and in particular enables you to, to compare the nearby symplectic form and gives you the variation of the symplectic form. That's not Heckman, in other words. Um, so that's, that's uh, one use of this theorem. And we have here an algebraic version of that. Let me say something about the ulterior motive behind this, these, these theorems. Um, in a recent paper, Gilliman, Miranda, and Weitzman uh, posed some questions about geometric quantization of B symplectic manifolds. In particular, a quantization commutes with reduction uh, uh, conjecture for log symplectic or B symplectic manifolds. Uh, so that's the, that's the question we intended to answer. And that will be taken up by Yanis in the next presentation in this workshop. Okay. Let me explain, explain in a little more detail this Darbu Moser Weinstein theorem. Here's the statement again. We have a Lie algebraid and a symplectic form on this Lie algebraid. I will explain to you what that means. I will explain what it means for a manifold to cleanly intersect the Lie algebraid, and I ex will explain what an Euler-like section is and what these things are useful for. Uh, symplectic Lie algebraid. You have a Lie algebraid over a manifold. I'm sorry if the notation is a little non-standard. I have an anchor the vector bundle map to the tangent bundle, and I have a Lie bracket on the global sections. And you have a corresponding uh, de ram eilenberg chevalet complex, uh, the A-valued differential forms. So they're just sections of the, the dual bundle, the exterior powers of the dual bundle, and I will call these Lie algebraic forms, or just A forms. And you have a, a differential, much like the, the, the RAM differential. The RAM differential just depends on being able to take brackets and on being able to, to differentiate. Well, in the Lie algebraid, the bracket and the anchor allow you to do that. So you have an analogous differential, the Lie algebraid differential. And you get this complex. Um, and then I think it's clear how you should define a symplectic form on a Lie algebraid. It's just an alternating bilinear form uh, on, in this, the RAM complex, A, the RAM complex, which is closed for this operator, D, A, and non-degenerate. Um, I believe this goes back to Nest and Siegen. Uh, they uh, noticed that the Fedosov uh, deformation quantization argument for symplectic manifold can be done just as well in this uh, Lie algebraic setting. So that's where this comes from. So some basic, uh, okay, uh, symplectic Lie algebraids are Poisson manifolds. Uh, the anchor and the symplectic form together enable you to put together a map from T star M to T M. Uh, out of T star M, you take the transpose map of the anchor, you get into the dual of the Lie algebraid. 
then in the symplectic form, we'll map you into the Lie algebraic, and then the anchor takes you back into the tangent bundle. And that composed map is the anchor of a Poisson structure. So we have this Poisson structure, in particular, symplectic leaves and everything. And some basic examples, classes of examples are well, a constant rank Poisson structure. So basically just a foliated manifold with symplectic forms on the foliation. Uh, so the foliation is a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle and on, uh, and on the, on the uh, sub-manifold A. And on this A, you have this symplectic form along the fibers. This is symplectic Lie algebra. Um, yesterday, we heard some talks about log symplectic forms uh, in a holomorphic context. That makes sense just as well in a smooth C infinity context. A normal crossing divisor in a manifold is simply a subset, which in local coordinates looks like a union of coordinate hyperplanes. So in this picture, M is a surface, and uh, the divisor Z is just a curve with a, one component as a transverse self intersection. <clears throat> And then there's another component which transversely intersects it. And then the uh, red thing, I've attempted to draw a vector field tangent to the normal crossing divisor. So such a vector field in particular would have to be zero at the self intersection points. <coughs> and such vector fields tangent to the divisor, uh, every component of the divisor. Uh, they form a subsheaf of the tangent sheaf, and it's a locally free sheaf. Namely, uh, it's the sections of a Lie algebra, the log tangent bundle of that normal crossing divisor. And the symplectic structure on that log tangent bundle, you call a log symplectic structure. And if the divisor is smooth, one single smooth hypersurface, you often, it's often called a B symplectic structure. Um, as we saw in the talks by Brandt and Travis, uh, uh, classifying these things is uh, hard work. Um, even the linear algebra is not completely straightforward. Uh, on a vector space of a fixed dimension, you have uh, only one symplectic form up to equivalence. Um, but for log symplectic forms, you have, can have many different ones. Uh, first of all, it depends on the number of hypersurfaces you have. Say on R4, if you have four hyperplanes and the four coordinate hyperplanes, then a typical log symplectic form would look like this. You have uh, poles, first order poles at each of the coordinate hyperplanes. And then you have these coefficients, these anti-symmetric matrix of coefficients in front of the, uh, 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 in front of the, uh, and, um, Depending on those coefficients, if you change the coefficients, the uh, symplectic leaves on the divisor will change uh, pretty drastically. So not all these log symplectic forms are equivalent. Um, similarly, you can see what uh, uh, a general log symplectic form, constant coefficients with three hyperplanes would look like. Yeah, uh, again, you have poles along each of the components of the divisor, first order poles. And again, you have lots of different ones. So that's symplectic Lie algebra. Now I need to explain to you what cleanly intersecting a Lie algebra means. Suppose you have a Lie algebra over a manifold and a submanifold N, or just an arbitrary map from a manifold in a uh, 2M, then that map cleanly intersecting the Lie algebra, uh, that's a shorthand for the tangent map of the map, cleanly intersecting the anchor. Yeah? So those are both of those are maps into the tangent bundle of M. I want them to cleanly intersect. And that's exactly the condition you need in order to be able to pull back the Lie algebra on a map, along a map. Pull back, uh, just forming the fiber product over the tangent bundle of M. And it's easy to check in any example when the map cleanly intersects a Lie algebra. 
uh, you just look at any point of your manifold n. You look at the image of the, the tangent map. So that's a subspace of the tangent space of M. And then you look at um, the tangent space to the Lie algebraic orbit. So that's the image of the anchor. So you get the sum of these two subspaces inside the ambient tangent space. And if that subspace is dimension independent of X, that's say exactly the same thing as J, the map J intersecting this Lie algebraic cleanly. And the map intersects the Lie algebraic transversely if and only if it is transverse to all the orbits of the Lie algebraic. There is a simple instance where the Lie algebraic is a uh, logarithmic tangent bundle. So the manifold is just R2. And the divisor is just the union of the, the, the x and y axes. And here's some four examples of submanifold in red. The, the top left, the manifold is nicely transverse to the divisor. In the top right example, it's uh, just one component of the divisor. That's also clean because if you look at the tangent space to the red manifold plus the tangent space uh, to the divisor at each point, then you get a one dimensional space at every point. In the bottom left, the submanifold is a single point, which is always clean. And the bottom right, something goes wrong. Although this N intersects each component transversely, it is not a clean intersection with this divisor because um, at the origin, the red tangent space is a line, uh, but the, uh, and the tangent space of the origin is a point, so you get a line. But away from the origin, the red tangent space plus the tangent space to M is two dimensional. This is not a clean intersection. Um, so if you have a clean intersection with this log tangent bundle, that, be, that just means that the um, divisor will restrict to a, um, uh, a normal crossing divisor on the submanifold. And that's what goes wrong in the bottom right. If you intersect that divisor, scheme theoretically with that submanifold, you get a double point at the origin. Now finally, I need to explain. Oh, I'm already almost out of time. Um, Euler-like vector fields and sections. Uh, that's this notion from these two papers: Bischoff, Burstein, Lima, and Meinrankin, and that other three-author paper. Uh, first, let me tell you what an Euler-like vector field is. An um, Euler-like vector field on a manifold with respect to a submanifold is a complete vector field which near that submanifold looks like the Euler vector field of a normal, of a tubular neighborhood. Um, and in fact, giving an Euler-like vector field uh, is the same as knowing uh, tubular neighborhood embedding. The Euler-like vector field tells you all you need to know about that tubular neighborhood embedding. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's one of the main points of these papers. There's a correspondence between tubular neighborhood embeddings and Euler-like vector fields. What is an Euler-like section of a Lie algebraic? Well, you have a Lie algebraic and a submanifold. An Euler-like section of the Lie algebraic along that submanifold. It's a section which vanishes along the submanifold, and such that the anchor of that section is an Euler-like vector field along that submanifold. Um, so, what's the utility? Uh, well, first, let me explain. Uh, uh, no, I'm running out of time, so let me skip this. Uh, let me explain. Uh, you, you, you have six minutes. I have um, six. Oh. Uh, you have six minutes. It ends at uh, half past. OK. OK, then I can go a little more slowly. Um, an Euler-like section in the case of a normal crossing divisor, logarithmic tangent bundle. Um, this is an Euler-like vector field along your submanifold. 
which is tangent to your divisor. And such a section exists, such an order-like section exists, exactly when your submanifold intersects the divisor cleanly. So here's these uh, four pictures again, where I have attempted to draw the Euler-like sections by these thick black strokes, which tell you approximately what a tubular neighborhood of the submanifold looks like. In all four of the pictures, except at the bottom right, you can find a nice tubular neighborhood, a nice Euler-like vector field, which is uh, tangent everywhere to, the, to those uh, uh, normal crossings, uh, components of the normal crossings divisor. Um, except in the non-clean example at the bottom right, where you run into trouble at the origin. There is no Euler-like vector field along the submanifold, which is tangent to both axes. So these things don't always exist. What are these Euler-like sections good for? Um, so here's a theorem of this boost in Lima Meinrecken paper. Um, there's this famous theorem, a uh, normal the uh, form theorem, Dufour Fernandez Weinstein splitting theorem for Lie algebras. It tells you that if you restrict to a submanifold transverse to the Lie algebra, um, then you can split your Lie algebra. Your Lie algebra looks like well, the pullback of the restriction of the Lie algebra to the submanifold. And the boosting Lima Meinrenken theorem is, I'd like to think of it as a quantitative version of this theorem. The Euler like section tells you exactly how to obtain such an isomorphism. The anchor of the Euler like section is an Euler like vector field, tells you how to get a tubular neighborhood, U. And on this tubular neighborhood, uh, the Euler-like section will give you a flow on your Lie algebra and will uh, give you a Lie algebra isomorphism of the restricted Lie algebra to that tubular neighborhood. And the Lie algebra, on the other hand, the Lie algebra restricted to the submanifold and then pulled back to the tubular neighborhood. So that's the splitting theorem. That's for transverse submanifolds. This goes wrong if the submanifold is merely clean. Still, there's something to be said. Uh, if the submanifold cleanly intersects the Lie algebra, this Euler like section may not exist. And the splitting theorem usually fails. It's not even the dimensions of these two, sorry, of these two vector bundles are not even the same. So the splitting theorem fails. Yet you have something. You don't have a splitting theorem, you don't have an isomorphism, but you have a retraction, a deformation retraction of the the algebra on a small open neighborhood, tubular neighborhood of the manifold and the restricted Lie algebra. And that deformation retraction is enough to get a homotopy equivalence between the RAM complexes. And that's exactly the kind of thing you need to prove the Darboux Moser Weinstein theorem. So let me finish by briefly explaining what, we, what, what I mean by a deformation refraction. That's a special kind of Lie algebra homotopy, which I think goes back to the Kranich Fernandez paper, uh, homotopies of Lie algebra paths. Uh, that notion uh, uh, generalizes to arbitrary homotopies of Lie algebra as follows. A Lie algebra homotopy is simply, you have two Lie algebra, A and B over two different manifolds, and you have a, uh, uh, you have a Lie algebra morphism from the tangent bundle of the unit interval cross A into that second Lie algebra. Okay, and then you have a time zero and a time one map and you say that phi is a homotopy between those two Lie algebra morphisms. And just as in ordinary Durham theorem, Durham theory, a uh, physical, a geometric homotopy induces a chain homotopy. So if two Lie algebra morphisms are homotopic, then the induced maps on the Durham uh, complexes are algebraically homotopic. Refraction is a special case of homotopy. We have a submanifold 
uh, which cleanly intersects the Lie algebroid, then you can restrict the Lie algebroid. And then you can ask, is there a deformation retraction between A and that restricted Lie algebroid? And that's just a homotopy between that Lie algebroid and the restricted Lie algebroid. And if you have such a deformation retraction, you get a homotopy equivalent between the two the Ram complexes. And that's enough to give you the uh, to apply be able to apply Moses path method and to get the Darbu Moser Weinstein theorem. And now I'm over time, so let me stop here. Thank you. <laughs>